All right. Happy Saturday evening, everybody. Um, felt the need to do a no-notice live stream based on world events. So thanks for joining me. Um, let's give a little time for everybody to circle up here. So I'll let me do a scene setter and uh, then we'll go to the, the chat here and, and have a have a discussion. So this morning, as subscribers hopefully saw, did an episode, current events episode, about the American Intel assessment that a strike was imminent and uh, framed it with the fact that Iran has the largest inventory of cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and uh, and drones. Both this type <laughs> and the type that we've seen in, uh, in and around the uh, Houthi region and around Ukraine and, and so forth, there are these, uh, these Quds drones, uh, I'm sorry, the Shahed drones, um, which Iran manufactures and, and they've also licensed the Russians to manufacture. So this was all a function of this attack that happened on April 1st, where in, in the IDF, the Israelis still have not uh, admitted that they were the ones who, who conducted this strike. But this was a strike on the Iranian embassy complex in Damascus, that building that is uh, damaged there is, is the consulate. And what the Iranians targeted this for, I'm sorry, what the Israelis targeted this for was uh, the fact that uh, there were a number of IRGC Quds Force officials gathered there and uh, seven of them were, were, were killed. So the Iranians were obviously not happy about this strike and and said they were going to retaliate. So based on that statement and the various intel fusion that, that we had in the region, uh, we predicted, felt that this was imminent. So we sent General Kurilla to the region, he's CENTCOM, to do some planning, some assessment, and whatever else he may have said to the Iranian defense officials uh, around the idea that uh, the Iranians would be striking. And so some of this is probably to assess in the event that the Iranians do strike, what is it you guys, meaning Israel, think you would do in response to that? And so we'll have a conversation about that as we as we go along here. All right. So also reviewed the fact that we have assets in theater, specifically the Eisenhower Strike Group, something we've documented for six months now, how both the Arleigh Burke class destroyers and the Super Hornets in the air wing have been taking down both drones and ballistic missiles that are aimed at primarily commercial shipping. So we've gotten pretty good at, at doing that. And the other headline this morning was the fact that several of the Arleigh Burks were moved closer to the Strait of Hormuz from either the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden to kind of deter the Iranians from doing what they've what they've done. So obviously that didn't that didn't work. Um, so at about 1630 Eastern Daylight Time, the first word came out that the Iranians had launched an estimated 100 to 120 drones at uh, that were headed towards Israel. So drones are not fast, either this type or this type. They go 120, 130 knots 
you know, it's like a, a, a Cessna 172 or maybe a, a faster prop plane, maybe. And then as the word continued, the Iranian state media said, no, we've also fired ballistic missiles. So those go 400, 500 knots. So now you do the time distance and when the initial word came out and you're like, well, they have three hours before these drones will be in Israeli airspace. Now it's like, well, no, actually you have an hour and a half or an hour. So the tension was ratcheted up um, rapidly. So ultimately, or what has happened so far, and once I frame this, I'm going to go to the comments because I'm not watching any media right now. So if something happens that changes what I'm talking about, then let's let's make sure we put it in the chat. So, so far, what we know is ballistic missiles reached the skies over at least Jerusalem and were intercepted. Not quite sure how they were intercepted, whether it was Iron Dome or fighter cover, either Israeli Air Force fighters or even American airplanes. What I heard on the news was there there was, and I've seen in other traffic on social media, is there was a tanker airborne, an Air Force heavy tanker airborne uh, somewhere in the region, you know, Jordan, Syria. We'll take a look at the map in, the, in a second and try to imagine where these drones and missiles originated from and what path they'd have to take and how we plan to intercept them, how we have intercepted them already. Um, so when you look at this image here, these are weapons, again, I'm guessing based on the fact that they had, um, you know, plumes that that these weren't drones these were ballistic missiles and because of the trajectory i'm thinking they're ballistic missiles and not cruise missiles because these are are, are higher in the sky so iranian state media says we've fired drones cruise missiles and ballistic missiles i'm thinking that what's been intercepted so far are these ballistic missiles and this image was taken uh from the ground in in jerusalem Again, we'll, we'll take a look at, at the map in a, in a second here. So what the Pentagon told the press corps there is the U.S. military was involved in taking down drones, specifically said drones, before they reached Israel. So let me go ahead and bring up a map here. So I will do a little screen sharing. Pardon my my button allergy here. Okay, so here we are in the in the region. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Let me let me see what you guys are seeing here. Hold on. So. Basically, you know, what we see here, Persian Gulf to the east, you can see the western edge of the border with Iraq here, and then the countries in play, Syria, Jordan, Beirut, and Israel. So to fire weapons from Iran to Israel, you're going to have to cross over, assuming that they're firing from these northern regions. If they fire from like Bandar Abbas, Shiraz, which is where the Tomcats are based, um, Bushir up here in the northern part, um, then they could potentially cross over Saudi. But if they fire from the northern part of Iran, then they just would travel over Iraq, maybe Syria, but they could just go over Iraq through Jordan into places like 
you know, let's say they're, they're targeting military facilities or industrial facilities, Haifa, um, generally they'll target Tel Aviv, but, you know, if they're going after where the F-35s are based, if they're going after their, you know, if it's counter military targeting, uh, then you wouldn't go after Jerusalem um, and you wouldn't go after Tel Aviv. So the fact that that image was taken over Jer 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 Jerusalem um, doesn't mean that was the, the target, but we don't know. So the other thing that happened is as the missiles were still here, let me stop sharing this. Hold on for a second. As the missiles were inbound, uh, Iran made a statement that said it's over. Um, which, you know, is kind of curious. And that maybe that means that when these missiles land or get intercepted, that's all we plan on doing, but we'll, we'll discuss that. So that's what we know. So let me now go to the comments. And um, let's just have a, a, a chat here. And I apologize that this, this live stream is wildly disorganized. Um, it's been a crazy day between doing the episode this morning um, and, um, you know, the, the unfolding events, the, the, prognostication of the episode coming true, let's say. Okay, so Viking Prepper says, they said there will be a big response. And my good friend and patron Himmelganger in Norway says, why should there be a big response? Iran doesn't seem to want to widen the conflict. If the U.S. also doesn't want to, why would it strongly respond? Meaning Israel. Why would Israel strongly respond? Well, that's that's the thing that nobody can figure out at this point. I will say the one variable that is concerning in the face of the fact that Iran has shown the willingness to do, to take this step, which was surprising to many. Um, you know, the, the, some pundits, military experts said that the reason that the Israelis went after the consulate in Damascus was because they were pretty convinced that they were calling Iran's bluff. And so Iran is willing to prop up proxies and let others do their bidding, but if they were called out, they wouldn't act. So obviously that calculus has changed in that Iran has reacted. And in some ways, you could say that Israel overplayed their hand here. And what I mean by that is October 7th, if we believe that this whole thing started on October 7th, and I did that one episode that, you know, went all the way back to literally biblical times to describe who was winning or losing throughout the centuries in terms of that region, Palestine, Israel. Um, and it's complicated, to put it mildly. So you could say it starts, you know, in the late 1800s. It, it could start mid-20th century, or it could start on October 7th. For the sake of this discussion, let's just say that this particular conflict started on October 7th when Hamas attacked southern Israel and, and that the tragedy of what occurred on that day. So naturally... Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is a hawk, is going to react in a very strong way and has, in, in fact, uh, particularly the Biden administration, uh, believes he's overreacted. And as they were about to do the final strike, the final campaign against Rafa, everybody believed, or most folks were thinking that, okay, this war in Gaza is coming to a close. To the Netanyahu administration, to the idea of satisfaction, they've eliminated Hamas's military capability. And, and so, okay, lots of innocents killed, lots of collateral damage, Gaza leveled, but maybe we can just sort of say, okay, this, this particular con conflict is finite, 
and America's wish that this not spread has been met. So American presence perhaps assisted in this not spreading, so forth and so on. Okay, now, seven or two weeks ago, with that strike on the embassy slash consulate in Damascus, the the calculus changed. I did that episode, and the title of it is Israel trying to draw Iran into the war. And if you're pro-Israeli, or if you're, you know, in the IDF targeting cell, you could say, well, that was a valid target. That's not the Iranian embassy. That was a terror cell. And they were planning on either what proxy group, Hamas, Hezbollah, whomever, they were planning strikes against Israel. So we got it. We have no choice but to take it out. However, when you strike the Iranian embassy, that's a strike against Iran. And so now you've called them out and now they've answered the bluff. So the calculus, regardless of whether this is a one and done for the Iranians or not, has completely changed. And with General Kirill going to Iran and all the statements that have been made by President Biden and others about, you know, we're, we're, make no mistake, if, unless you were, you know, maybe you were confused because of the tension that, that he's had with Netanyahu in recent weeks. Maybe you were confused, but we stand with Israel. Okay, so now, as I described, we are assisting, even as we speak, with taking drones down. And we're kind of, you know, we're not neutral here. And and so what does the fact that the calculus has changed do in terms of the U.S. involvement? And now that, because even as we sit here, we don't know if the second and third wave of the drones is going to actually land. I think, and somebody check me on this, um, nothing has hit the ground yet. Is that is that true? Is there any anything I'm, I'm scrolling through the comments here nothing has hit the ground yet however the fact that these weapons drones cruise missiles ballistic missiles were launched in the first place is kind of all it takes for israel to declare okay now you've gone you've stepped over a line and we're going to retaliate so the tit for tat continues all right. Now, remember, some years ago, the Israelis launched F-16s to take out Iran's nuclear capability. And so what are they willing to do now um, to kneecap them further as they're, you know, they're making enriched uranium. They don't have nuclear weapons yet, but so forth and so on. Right. So I said Iran, I think I'm in Iraq in terms of what they what those F-16s struck. Um, so this is a completely different war now, regardless of whether or not these weapons land. So let me bring up some questions. So Rail says, has Iran depleted their drones by sending them to Russia? No, they're, they're, Production capability is is very high, um, so no. The answer is no. Randy asked, "Any aircraft in play?" So, in terms of Iranian aircraft, um, the answer so far is is no. Um, now, in terms of U.S. aircraft, the answer is unknown. You know, I mean, they they could have been airborne tonight uh, and shooting down the drones like they've learned to shoot down the drones that the Houthis fire. You know, we're getting good. We are good at that now. Um, and the Iranians, I'm sorry, the Israelis uh, have been good at that for, for years.
Tom asked, how much of their stockpiles did Iran send? Would 100 munitions be 1% of stockpiles, 2%, 5%? Uh, I, I don't know what their inventory is. If somebody knows that, uh, please um, let, us, let us know. Um, Patrick says, it's over, hold my falafel. Yeah, that's that's probably right. It, it's it's not over by any stretch. So Kirk Fickert says, sounds like a one and done drone attack from Iran. If nothing major is hit, this probably ends here. I hope you're right, Kirk. Uh, because if... Israel now strikes Iran proper, then we've got a ramp up happening that there's no end in sight. And I don't want to be alarmist and I don't want to say World War III, but that exchange is what we were trying to prevent. It's already in progress. And arguably, it started with Israel. Again, if you're trying to solve a problem, which is we're trying to eliminate Hamas's military capability. That was my understanding of the mission as a function of October 7th. If you're trying to solve that problem, then you you don't introduce other, let's, and I'll be polite, variables by that drone strike on Damascus. You could say, I'm trying to be sort of unbiased here, you could say that was an unforced error by Israel. And now in the face of the other shoe dropping, I think that's inarguable that it was an unforced error. So, um, but I hope you're right, Kirk. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah, that's what I was saying, Mitch. Iranian drones produced under license in the Russian Federation. Now, as we documented, the Ukrainians attacked that factory, um, which was a long way away, 750 miles away. Um, they actually attacked a dormitory, I understand, um, that housed workers at the factory. Um, but yes, the, they have exported that, that manufacturing capability. It's over. Can mean what you suggest, Ward, or something else? What else? Well, I think what they mean, and maybe they're trying to tamp down the response. Um, so, again, it was a little bit curious that even as the weapons are in flight, you say it's over, you know. Um, and I, I don't know what that would mean other than this is our response to what you did in Damascus. So, you know, tit for tat. Although if I send a single drone and it launches one munition at a building, admittedly kit, kill seven important military figures in the Iranian military, um, then to respond by launching and we're unclear of what the numbers of ballistic missiles and cruise missiles are, but the numbers we've heard of drones is 100 to 120, right? So that, that doesn't seem like a proportional response to what the Israelis did to them. Um, is Jordan still allied with Israel? I believe it is. Now, the other thing, since you brought up Jordan, so in response to all of this, the airspace was shut down. It probably still is shut down. Now, remember, Israel is seven hours ahead of us. Uh, I mean, us. I know we have people all over the world, but I, I'm on the east coast of the United States. Um, so um, what does that make it? It's 2024. So 324 in the morning in, in Israel. Um, so... Um, the airspace was shut down in Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, and, um, and obviously Israel. Um, you heard air raid sirens going off uh, as those weapons were being taken out over particularly Jerusalem. 
Um, so, you know, again, this was a serious situation and it's over, but uh, if a weapon hits, it, it, it's going to change the already changed calculus even more. Um, again, just Iran just took hostage a civilian container ship. Yeah, I documented that in the episode this morning. Um, they uh, had some of their special forces repel from a helicopter onto um, the Ares, which is a Portuguese flagged um, Israeli owned. The Zodiac Group owns that Portuguese flagged container ship. So, yes, they did uh, take possession of, of that container ship. Um, this was before the missile strike. Uh, I hear another YouTuber about Iran sent nukes to Israel. Maybe that's what they refer to is over. Um, I, I, I don't know what you mean by sent nukes. Like they launched nukes at Israel. That, 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 that can't be true. Um, so Hawk says, I guess the question is if Iran did just enough to save face, Part of why they denounce it. I, I think that's that's true. So part of this is Arab street facing. You know, again, Iran is an Arab, they're Persian, but um, you know, Muslim street facing, let's say. So if the Vox Populi believes that this was a suitable response to the Zionist regime, then maybe that's what they meant. And that's why they would broadcast it, hoping that the Israelis would sort of go, okay, get it. And that in company with the Americans saying, look, don't do anything rash. Um, in response, let's wrap up Gaza and let's try to figure out the next iteration of some sort of peace plan, whatever that would uh, would look like. Um, and if that's even possible, right? But we certainly don't want to want to escalate. And right now, today was a escalatory day. Two weeks ago, thirteen days ago, was a semi-escalatory day, right? But in hindsight, it was another escalatory day. So what I surmised in the title of that episode is Israel trying to draw Iran into the war um, was a valid question, you know, and, and now they have. So update, yes, the drones are still traveling towards Israel. So do the time distance, right? Uh, so it's what? I mean, how far is it from Iran to Israel? 500 miles? Um, so if you're going 100 plus knots, you know, that's about what? A six hour trip, you know? So we're getting to where, um, again, I, I got first word at 430 local and now that's about four hours ago. So they still have an hour or so, um, you know, to... Uh, until they would get there. Now, I'm thinking the the main threat is the ballistic missiles because of the, the speed and the trajectory, uh, and also the 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 cruise missiles, drones, and especially we talk about a hundred drones. You know, with the web of of point missile defense and other electronic pulses that make drones go stupid that we have in the field, uh, not directed energy weapons, but just uh, EMP weapons that we have, um, and fighters in the air that have kick-ass, you know, um, scanned array radars that can do all kinds of track while scan and multiple targets and low Doppler tracking look down, shoot down, all the stuff that that they have in the 4.5 fifth gen airplanes that we have now. 
Um, I'm thinking the drones will not reach sovereign Israel. That's Mooch's prediction. So if they launched one wave of ballistic missiles that have been taken out by either Iron Dome or the other systems that the Israelis have, you know, they have a nice defense in depth. It's not just Iron Dome. In fact, Iron Dome is the sort of close-in weapon system. The, the, uh, they have a med- medium range and a long range point missile defense system. And so I think what we saw over Jerusalem was some weapons that slipped through and were taken out by Iron Dome. It looked a lot like what we'd seen in the early days of the war. Um, now, I've never seen Iron Dome in action in real life. Um, been to Israel a bunch of times when I was in the Navy. Uh, we'd pull into Haifa on a regular basis, uh, but I've never seen Iron Dome in action. Um, so, but that's that's what I'm thinking. Uh, the main threat was the ballistic missiles and the cruise missiles, and perhaps that wave has already happened and was taken out. The drones, if they're still en route, they again, my guess, they won't they won't make it all the way to um, to Israel. So where that could have been a problem is if you launch drones early and the air defense networks are dealing with a drone swarm. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not sure a hundred constitutes a swarm. You know, I mean, it's, that's, that's a good amount. If you spread them out, multi-axis attack. I don't know how sophisticated this was either. I guess we'll find this out in the days to come. But if you're watching that low, slow flyers, and that's where your focus is, and then suddenly here come ballistic missiles, here come cruise missiles with a similar TOT, now you've created a, a, a robust problem for the, the defenders. Now, it doesn't appear like that's what happened. It seems like the drones were, were fired, got heads up, drones inbound at 110 knots, lumbering along. So you can just marshal all your forces there to take those down when they get in your missile envelopes or whatever it is you're firing to take them down. And then in the meantime, they launched these ballistic missiles that went way ahead of the drones. So that's not a coordinated attack. Um, and so I think that made the prob- problem easier to tackle for the Israelis. But I'm guessing this is all just surmising based on, on the images that we've seen. So Mr. Chill says, Israel attacked an embassy. That's unprecedented. I agree, but they would say that we didn't attack the embassy. We attacked, we attacked a consulate adjacent to the embassy that was full of Quds leadership planning mayhem on us. That's I'm, I'm just saying that that's the asterisk on your statement. But the fact that they arguably attacked an embassy has changed the calculus and given Iran justification in pro-Iranian circles pro-Palestinian circles, anti-Israeli circles for this attack that's ongoing. So again, my question for Israel is, was this necessary? You've got, you know, a, a, a small war going on over here. You've got, you know, an asymmetric war. You've got a regional conflict that you've been fighting for decades against, you know, the Palestinian Authority and Hezbollah. And now you introduce the potential for a conventional war against a peer peer opponent. I I don't know why that was necessary. You know, Um, I get it when a brain trust is there. That's a high value target. Intel, you know, that's a rare moment when you can take those guys out at once. But Obviously, hindsight is 2020. As we look at what's happening now, the entropy, the the chaos that induced, I don't think made that decision to target that worth it. So Jim says, Iran started the night as a threat and ended as a joke. Um, I think that depends on um, where you're sitting. So if we consider 
like what would have been effective is if these weapons had hit the ground, if there had been damage done to Israeli targets, that there had that when we turn on whatever our news channel is of choice and we see fires burning in the streets of Tel Aviv and ships pier side in Haifa that are ablaze and blown up F-35s on the ramp. If that's what we would determine as mission success for Iran, then perhaps you're right. However, again, in the Muslim world, the calculus is a little more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, fungible. And so I'm not sure that they're a joke. I think now suddenly they've become a power involved directly in a way that is of great concern. I think everybody's surprised that they took this step. You know, I, I know a lot of folks that, that I was talking to were like, they would never do that. And that's what the Israelis know to be true. So that's why they struck the embassy in Damascus. So I'm not sure they're a joke. So again, here's another sort of, so Israel bombs Iran's foreign mission in Syria, which is a breach of international law and the world expects what? Um, I, there are, South African, there are a bunch of people who agree with you, right? Um, that's what I was just saying. Brent Beecham says this could easily be tit for tat, depends on the Israeli response, right? I mean, the tat part is we await the Israeli response. So let's just say again, this sub part of the October 7th conflict started on April 1st. That's where, because otherwise it's just world opinion is leaning on the IDF to knock off the heavy handed stuff. You know, it's all about humanitarian, you know, that's another footfall where the Israelis took out that um, that uh, world central kitchen convoy and, and killed seven of their employees. You know, that that's that's a, a tragedy that that if you're trying to see it Israel's way, that makes it hard, if not impossible, like there was no immediate threat. Why did you target that? And I did the episode a couple of weeks ago about that particular incident where there was miscommunication. I mean, when you have a fratricide or a blue on blue, this isn't quite blue on blue, but when you have unintended consequences from a strike, there's always like missteps. There's perception on the part of the drone operator Technology is a wonderful thing, but the problem with drone warfare is you're looking at the battlefield through a soda straw. And so, plus, these drones don't exactly have high-resolution screens. So, saw, thought he saw weapons, thought they went into this hangar, and these guys came out, these guys went in, whatever. Um, at the end of all of that, world opinion turns against Israel with the humanitarian crisis and the scenes of devastation in Gaza, world opinion uh, has increasingly gone against Israel. It's not unlike what happened to the United States after 9-11. You know, on October 7th and the weeks that followed before the invasion, the world was unanimously, well, not unanimously, but uh, third parties were sympathetic to the Israeli suffering and agreed that something had to be done about the threat. Um, and then when the airstrikes start, you again, you see these images of city blocks being taken out, get word that, oh, and they're not even using precision bombs all the time. Sometimes they're using dumb bombs. Um, and then humanitarian corridors, and then the food isn't getting through. And these, you know, NGOs are reporting about the spread of disease and suffering. And, and so 
now the good and bad picture is blurred massively. So particularly President Biden gets to pre gets with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who's got like, okay, let's wrap it up. And he finally, in the wake of that, those WCK employees getting killed, said, okay, now I'm going to do the thing that, you know, I'm going to say the thing that we never say when we talk. Funding could be hazarded as a function of this. You know, financial support. And so at that point, He's like, okay, we'll open that Northern Corridor, so forth and so on. So among all that, we've got this thing sort of in a, a box of sorts. You know, there's no, it's like, okay, this isn't spreading. It looks like perhaps it could be ending. Yes, every once in a while, it looks like Israel does something. Let's just be polite and call it reckless. And now, again, my point is, is on April 1st, they shattered all of that with that strike. And now with this Iranian response, retaliatory strike, as they're calling it, it's further completely a different conflict. Now, we're not even talking about Rafa. That campaign is off. So whatever the Israelis thought they were going to do to once and for all, you know, tamp out the Hamas military threat, now their eye is way off the ball. So whatever your opinion is, as a military planner, that was a bad plan. Unless your strategic goal is to draw the entire world into, you know, a wider conflict. And I, you know, cynics, critics of Netanyahu could say that's his motivation. I do not believe that's the case. I think he overplayed his hand. Um, and so as a function of that, now the United States has to kind of figure out how to keep this thing in check when it's spinning wildly out of control. All right. So as Brent says, now, like what's next? Well, your move, Israel, assuming that what the Iranians said about it's over from their part is in fact true. Assuming that nothing else sneaks through and actually hits the ground. So let me look at the comments. As we're sitting here, has there been any other th things happening on the ground in Israel. So if, if it is, uh, please somebody uh, put something in the chat. All right, I'm just, uh, apologize for the dare. I'm just reading comments. So this is a point that we were making earlier, Kevin. The Israeli government will use the opportunity to go after Iran's nuclear production facilities. That may be true, right? Um, and so we'll have to see. But I, I agree with you there. That that could be, and again, their justification is, hey, everybody, look, they're willing to strike us with ballistic missiles, not just these suicide drones that, you know, put around at 100 knots. They launched ballistic missiles in large numbers at not just military targets, but civilian population centers, this was a terror raid. And so, you know, imagine these same decision makers with nuclear weapons. That would be their justification for doing what you say. So we'll have to see. But that's in play now in a way it wasn't before. So repent says no other date free the hostages of 7th October. So that's the other thing that now because of this exchange, the hostage situation is, is now completely like deprioritized in terms of what is agenda item one in the event that we can even have a conversation about how to get this thing under control. You know, we're very close reportedly at some points, to meaningful hostage ex exchanges in good numbers as a way to mitigate the conflict in Gaza. But now we're, we're completely like orders of magnitude away from that. So um, 
the hostage situation, unfortunately, is now uh, a tertiary concern, which is profane. But that's what was put into play um, by this back and forth that we're we're experiencing now. So the other the other thing, because um, I see some sort of extreme statements about how to deal with Iran, Iran. Um, so the the other thing about because sometimes in the comments when I'm doing these episodes about uh, Israel, Hamas, or Houthis, or, or just the let's say the region since October seventh, the last six months of what's gone on in that region, uh, people will uh, lecture me or whomever in the comments about war is messy, and Netanyahu's doing what's correct, and that's that's just the way it is. You got to be tough. You got to you got to. Uh, there's no half measures. History shows that that's never the case. And a superior technological military has suffered at the hands of Byzantine forces in this century. You know, I mean, I spent time in Afghanistan. I was embedded with uh, with our troops and got to see the chaos and the drones and the all the ways that we would respond to a single AK-47 going off. But 20 years later, for all of our efforts, we hand the country back to the Taliban and it's back to where it was when we got there. So this is the lesson of Vietnam. This is this is now the lesson of how Israel is prosecuting this war is you can't bomb an enemy into submission. And and superior technology not leveraged in an effective way is not an advantage. So I just ask that we all kind of, you know, take the near-term lesson out of the steps that have been done under the auspices of eliminating the military threat of Hamas. And when you over-execute all the other pieces that you send into motion, you can't control until they come back to bite you in ways you did not foresee. And ultimately, it can hazard your ability to prevail in the conflict. So that's kind of what we saw in not so much Iraq, but Afghanistan. It's definitely what we saw in Vietnam. I mean, we, United States, it's what Israel is threatening to be guilty of in the prosecution of their war against Hamas. You know, so it's like we've sort of lost the plot. It's kind of like when the Bush administration conflated Al-Qaeda with the Taliban. The original threat was Al-Qaeda in the wake of 9-11. And then suddenly it's the Taliban, and then suddenly we're not just eliminating the the threat of terrorism, we're nation building and so forth, right? That's That was the problem. Um, and so same here. The conversation isn't Hamas anymore, pr- principally now, and hostages. The conversation is now Iran. And so in so changing that calculus, uh, that's where Israel uh, has overplayed their hand, has misstepped with respect to, if you think the mission was eliminate Hamas's military capability, um, that's not the mission suddenly anymore. And so, yes, these things are all in play now. And you know, we'll just have to stay tuned to see how this plays out over the next few days. Um, so um, thanks. To, we had a gigantic crowd. We had like 12,000 people at one at one point here, um, which is a record for, for a live stream. Um, so I, I just wanted to sort of have a discussion with you guys um, and, and just add some detail that, you know, I mean, as soon as the strikes started, 
my episode from this morning is woefully overcome by events. You know, so I felt the need to quickly get some other information on the streets. As soon as I end this stream, it'll become an episode. So, uh, and the episode includes all of the comments. Um, so, you know, if you miss something or, you know, come back later and check it out again. Again, thanks to everybody. We still have 8,700 people here in spite of uh, me rambling here. Um, another uh, tidbit in terms of my ability to pay attention to this over the next few days. So, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily a, a news channel, right? I mean, uh, I, this is uh, supposed to be a celebration of military aviation. And then over the years that we've been doing this, uh, we've sort of fared in some other prevailing wind, including current events, started with the war in Ukraine and then the, uh, the post-October 7th conflicts. Uh, so, you know, it's become something that we've done. You all have responded in a way that uh, you appreciate the information. I appreciate you guys showing up and asking good questions, having good discussions. Uh, so that's that's awesome, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and hopefully you, you find value. And I appreciate the feedback I get in the comments. I try to read as many as I can. I get up at 4 in the morning, and between 4 and 6 a.m., I read comments. That's what I do first thing uh, and try to answer what I can. But, but your unflinching honesty... Uh, helps me, you know, get it right. So I appreciate that. And the other pitch I'll give, if you're not a subscriber, become one. So you get heads ups about things like, oh, Mooch is doing a live stream out of nowhere, that sort of stuff. So that's why uh, subscription is a good thing. But my point is, over the next few days, I'm flying out to the USS Harry S. Truman off the coast. And I'm going to shoot a bunch of episodes out there with my good friend, Hoser Miller, who's been on the channel a bunch, former Hornet pilot, as you guys know, author of uh, the Raven series and Silver Waterfall. But we're going out there to capture flight deck action and talk to sailors who work on all parts of the ship and talk to some of the VFA 11 guys, the Red Rippers, former Tomcat squadron, and just go out to the boat. We're flying the cod out there on Monday morning. Um, that'll be my first trap in many years. First time on an aircraft carrier since 1998. I've been on amphibs and some other ships since then, but this will be my first time back on uh, the boat for a long time. So I'm very psyched about that. So my point is I won't be able to monitor uh, things um, as I can when I'm here in the Moochline facility. So if, if I'm absent over the next 48, 72 hours, that's why. Uh, tomorrow I'll be around uh, for most of the day. So if there's anything else that we need to talk about, um, I'll uh, make sure that we we cover it. Um, uh, it's funny because I was working on an episode about flybys, like crazy flybys, football game flybys, which I'm still working on. That's a, it's a cool one. Um, I was talking to uh, the patrons yesterday at our happy hour about this episode. So that's what I was working on. And then suddenly this situation this morning, uh, you know, unfolded and then got even more intense this afternoon. So again, this day has unfolded in a way that I did not foresee, but um, I, I do uh, appreciate the ability to communicate with you guys and uh, the sort of impact of this channel is, is developed over the years we've been doing this. So thanks to all of you. Again, if you're not a subscriber, become one uh, so you don't miss anything. And uh, I look forward to talking to you guys again very soon. Thanks for showing up. And, uh, you know, let's, let's try to calm things down as much as we can. All right. Stay tuned.